With me I have Diana Butu, a lawyer and the formal legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team. Diana, thank you very much for joining us here My on our pleasure. Team. I'd like to start with the United Nations bid that gave the Palestinians upgraded status. President Abbas said that the vote was a turning point, but was it? Have the rules of the game changed? Not at all. One of the problems with the upgrading of the status is that it um, was done largely for symbolic reasons and not really for anything that is legal reasons. I wish that it could be a turning point. In, in other words, I wish that Mahmoud Abbas would abandon the strategy of negotiations endless negotiations and instead start moving towards a legal strategy or trying to hold Israel accountable or trying to get world support but he's not doing that and instead my fear is that this was largely a symbolic move designed to boost his own popularity a popularity that's been dropping but that it's really not going to change anything on the ground other than the signs but if anything could it be argued that it's backfired because since that announcement there have been at least 5,000 settlement units that have been announced by the Israeli government? Well, the Israelis would have built the settlements with or without the UN status. It's, uh, the settlements are the one feature that has existed in this place since 1967, pretty much within two weeks of the start of Israel's occupation in June of 1967. Settlements began and there's never really been a stop in settlement construction. Um, the Israelis are always looking to an excuse and pointing to, to an excuse, but they're not never really um, serious about it. It's always a question of just building and expanding settlements because they can. Nobody's held them accountable. And so going back to the UN vote, I wish that he would use this opportunity to change the rules of the game, to sign on to the International Criminal Court and to start uh, holding Israel accountable for this settlement construction and expansion. These are war crimes. Uh, I wish he would also go and declare this apartheid just in the same way that other South African leaders have declared this apartheid. So why doesn't he? In large part because he's heavily dependent on um, foreign aid. Uh, more than 70% of uh, Palestinian, the day-to-day -day Palestinian economy, comes through the through, Pal through assistance from uh, from foreign donors, and I think that he's afraid that there will be re repercussions if he goes down that path. The other problem is that he's simply non-confrontational, and uh, really doesn't want to go down this path of actually having to bear the brunt of, of continuing to, to push forward for an end to Israel's uh, illegal activity. Is there almost a crisis in the Palestinian leadership? I mean, you're talking about the shortcomings of Abbas, but it's no secret that there's a huge rivalry between Hamas and Fatah and no unified leadership on that front either. We've had a crisis of leadership for a very long period of time, and so have the Israelis. On the Palestinian side, the crisis of leadership is that we don't have a leader who is willing to really stand up and uh, try to unite Palestinians together, try to push for an end to Israel's military occupation, who will try to bring together and embolden Palestinians and give them something to push for. Uh, instead, we've seen a leadership that is more interested in remaining in power. Both the leadership in the West Bank stays in power without elections. The leadership in the Gaza Strip is also, their, their term expired long ago. And so in terms of the Palestinians, there's a crisis of leadership. But there's a bigger crisis of leadership in, uh, among the Israelis. We have an Israeli prime minister who go to extreme lengths to continue to build and expand Israeli settlements, who doesn't want to confront uh, the settler movement, who simply wants to head Israel down the path of war and is willing to go to extreme lengths to get himself re-elected, including attacking Gaza. And yet, if we go back to the UN bid, the Israeli point was that it was a unilateral move that should not have been undertaken, rather that Israelis and Palestinians should first sit around the negotiating table. I remember hearing one of the Israeli spokespeople saying that you can't make peace without actually recognizing your partner. So why haven't the Palestinians come forward to the negotiating table? Well, let's talk about unilateral measures. And the first and for, first unilateral measure was taken by Israel and continues to be taken by Israel, and that's building and expanding the illegal settlements. They have never consulted the Palestinians and said, oh, we want to build here, we want to build there. They're all illegal under international 
law. So in terms of unilateralism, it's always been the Israelis have been pushing forward on the question of unilateralism. And it's for that very reason that Palestinian negotiators now are not sitting down with the Israelis, because you can't continue to sit down and negotiate with the Israelis while at the same time they're eating up the very land that, the, that you're supposed to be negotiating over. That doesn't make sense. What does make sense is to begin to put into place measures to hold Israel accountable. It's important to keep in mind that it's Israel that's occupying the Palestinians, not the other way around. And it will be Israel that has to end its occupation, not the other way around. So for us to move forward, now is the time that we have to see concrete unilateral, concrete, excuse me, international measures to, to hold Israel accountable. Do you think negotiations can still work between Israelis and Palestinians? Absolutely not. I was a part of the negotiating team for a period of five years, and the negotiations failed during that period of time. And they failed before I was there, and they failed after I left as well. They failed for a number of reasons, but primarily because we had two very unequal parties, um, Israel being the more powerful party and the Palestinians being the weaker party. And at the same time, while negotiations were being conducted, Israel as the more powerful party had the ability to change the rules of the game and to build and expand more Israeli settlements. Um, sitting at the negotiating table, it was always a question of power. And without another party to balance out that imbalance of power, negotiations will always fail. And what's the alternative? Can it only be unilateral moves? I think that the alternative is to begin to make this into a much more international issue by beginning to bring in international countries, uh, other countries around the world to hold Israel accountable, whether that's through sanctions, whether that's individually, individuals boycotting Israel, whether that's through a question of divestment, or uh, whether it's through Israel's isolation. It's no longer going to be a case or able for, for the weak Palestinians to stand up to a very strong nuclear power, Israel, and to, to expect um, that, those, that, that uh, the occupation is somehow going to end. But we're hearing from the Palestinian leadership that they're planning to launch an initiative to renew negotiations with the Israelis. So it doesn't seem as if they've completely given up on negotiations. You know, the definition of insanity, I believe uh, Albert Einstein said this, is to do things over and over again and expect a different result. Palestinians have been negotiating with the Israelis now for 20 years. So I'm not sure that, uh, that this meets the definition of insanity, but I think it's pretty close. The idea of going back to negotiations when we've seen what the outcome has been in the past. Uh, to me seems futile. I think instead this is a leadership that should start empowering uh, Palestinians. It should start pushing for nonviolent resistance. It should start pushing for boycotts. It should start pushing the world to sanction Israel, to isolate Israel. This is the type of leadership the Palestinians need and these are the steps that will work. You were a former advisor to the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Did you quit because you lost faith in negotiations? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a um, I, I went through a, a very deep crisis of faith when I began to see that the only strategy that was being adopted was one of negotiations in the face of uh, countless, countless announcements of settlement expansion, the, the face of Israel's construction of the wall. Um, and the only position that the Palestinian Authority continued to adopt was to go back to more and more negotiations without any visions, without, without any sort of idea of what would happen if those negotiations failed. I couldn't be part of that process any longer. Would the terms for peace be different now than they were when you were negotiating back in 2000, 2005? No, they're, they're precisely the same. The, one of the problems that we faced during the negotiations was that Israel was unwilling to recognize the applicability of international law, meaning that uh, all of the territory that it occupied in 1967 does not belong to Israel. The world has said this. They said this in 1967. They've continued to repeat this every, every year. And yet, every step of the way, Israel wanted to build and expand more and more settlements to be able to take more Palestinian land in order to change the the boundaries and the borders. If, you, if there's a, a real commitment to peace on the part of Israel, it will recognize that it has to be part of the international community and recognize that in being part of the international community, it has to abide by international law. It, it can't be above the law and Palestinians can't be beneath it. So the terms haven't changed at all. What has changed is that 
over the course of the past 45 years, there's now been cemented a mindset among Israeli settlers that this land is theirs. And the reason that this mindset has been cemented is that nobody has actually challenged the Israeli settler movement to force them to get out. Rather than forcing them to get out, the government get, provides them to incentives to move in. That's where the problem lies. If you were advising President Abbas today, what advice would you give him? The first thing I would say is move away from moves that are largely symbolic and start focusing on holding Israel accountable. I would encourage him to sign up to the International uh, Criminal Court right away to start uh, pressing for the crime of apartheid to be challenged, Israel's crime of apartheid, to be pushing for Israel's isolation due to the fact that it's been building and expanding settlements. Uh, I would also be advising him that he should be empowering Palestinians to um, go out and protest nonviolently, and that he will be at the helm. He will be leading the way, not just sitting in a very fancy um, you know, office just across the street from where we're sitting right now. I would advise him as well that he should be pushing the international community to be isolating Israel, and that he should always at the same time be speaking very clearly in terms of um, an end to Israel's illegal activity and the reinstatement of Palestinian rights. Do you think there's a real chance for peace between Israelis and Palestinians? In the short term, no. No. I'm in the short term very pessimistic, but in the long term I'm optimistic. I'm pessimistic because I see that things aren't going to change, but in the long term I feel that this is not going to be sustainable. Diana Butu, thank you very much for joining us here on RT. Thank you. My pleasure.